Hello, biology class, and welcome to our section on terrestrial and aquatic systems. <clears throat> um, just a little refresher here. We're going to talk about two things, terrestrial biomes first. Biomes are just groups of similar ecosystems, and terrestrial mean, obviously means on land. Um, we refer to them as biomes. In aquatic systems, they are not called biomes. Uh, they are... Uh, we're, we divide the uh, two different groups into freshwater and marine ecosystems, and then the marine ecosystems are divided into zones. And we'll talk about that a little later. So let's start by looking at the terrestrial biomes. So here's a map showing uh, the major terrestrial biomes on our planet. 25% um, of the Earth's surface is above water, ter the terrestrial area. And so we call these different physical environments and different environments with different kinds of vegetation biomes. Um, they're groups of similar ecosystems. They're usually defined by the very conspicuous type of vegetation. For example, um, deciduous forest or grassland, because those are the uh, the main uh, the main vegetation that grows in those biomes. Um, one thing that's important to know, although these boundaries are shown in the map, they are not hard and fast boundaries because um, changes in climate are very gradual from place to place. So um, it's hard to put a specific boundary on where the biome begins and the biome ends. Also, you'll notice, I mean, we have similar biomes even if they're on different continents because when there are similar climatic factors, those areas will support the same kind of biome, even if the specific species are different and they're on different continents. So let's look at some of these main biomes. Let's start looking uh, at tropical rainforests. Um, the tropical rainforest uh, biome occurs on low lands near the equator. There's a lot of uh, intense sunlight, lots of rainfall, lots of moisture in the air. Um, you can look back on the map to see the uh, different geographic locations where we uh, find trop uh, tropical rainforest biomes. Um, very little light usually reaches the ground um, in the forest because the tall, dense canopy of foliage blocks that light. Um, tropical rainforests are the most complex of all communities. They support more species of plants and animals than any other biome on Earth. Um, their soils are often very nutrient poor because most of the nutrients are uh, tied up in the rich biomass of all of the organisms in the forest. Um, unfortunately, as you're probably all aware, deforestation has removed more than half of Earth's original rainforests. Um, as they've been converted into grazing lands or crops or um, other uh, resources for human beings. So uh, that's tropical rainforest. The savanna is a biome that refers to a tropical or subtropical grassland, usually scattered trees and woodlands. Um, the grasslands can be in areas of low or high um, seasonal precipitation. And um, they're generally on the interior of continents. You can, again, refer to the map to see the geographical areas where we find savannas. So the savanna has three distinct seasons. There's the cool and dry season, the hot and dry, and the warm and wet season. Um, their soils are richer than those in the rainforest, so they can support uh, agriculture or grazing. Uh, and... It's home to some of the world's largest herbivores, um, giraffes, elephants, rhinoceroses, kangaroos, um, antelope. Here we have some zebras grazing in the background, and uh, I'm not sure what some of those are in the distance. But um, obviously, you probably because of poaching and human settlement, a lot of these species are um, experiencing serious population declines as well. The desert. This biome is characterized by a lack of precipitation, um, typically less than 25 centimeters per year. There are hot deserts and cool deserts. Um, hot deserts, examples of these, it would just be very hot. Um, the temperatures reach um, very high 
uh, high levels. Uh, examples of those would be northern Africa, the Sahara Desert, um, mo- most of the Arabian Peninsula, Australia. Um, in the U.S., the Chihuahuan Desert and the Sonoran Desert in the um, in the southwestern states would be examples of hot deserts. There are also cool deserts. Um, the winter temperatures get really cold. The Great Basin Desert in Nevada and Utah, Painted Desert of the Four Corners are examples of those. The very driest deserts have almost no perennial vegetation, perennial meaning plants that live more than one year. Um, in deserts that are um, not quite that arid, the predominant producers are usually shrubs or um, cacti or other succulents. And the plant life in deserts, uh, you know this, I'm sure, um, is very adapted to this dry environment. They oftentimes have special adaptations to help them deal with uh, the dryness by helping them conserve water. Animals as well um, in deserts have adapted to these extreme temperatures and little available water in different ways. The chaparral biome um, would be, uh, these are biomes that are um, coastal, they're near the coast, characterized by dense spiny shrubs that have tough leaves. Um, And those shrubs are often coated with a thick cuticle to keep them from losing moisture, but it also makes the plants more flammable. So the chaparral biomes um, see pretty frequent fires. Um, The organisms of the chaparral are often adapted to this or maintained by periodic fires as well. Um, The chaparral biome is seen on our coasts of California, seen in Chile, Southwest Africa, Southwest Australia, Mediterranean Sea, and the plants from all these different regions are unrelated, but they're one. the one thing they do have in common um, are their adaptations and um, sometimes their appearance, but they are not the same species. Temperate grassland is another biome. Um, Prairies in North America, great examples of temperate grasslands, and they're very similar to savannas. One of the different big main differences is that in temperate grasslands, the prairie trees are found only near streams. Um, temperate grasslands typically have very, very rich soil, and um, you're familiar with this because uh, <laughs> just east of the Rocky Mountains, we have a lot of temperate grassland. Temperate deciduous forests, um, as the name suggests, contains deciduous trees, but also they contain coniferous trees as well. Um, Deciduous meaning trees that lose their leaves um, annually, and coniferous trees meaning trees that produce cones, like fir, uh, pine, spruce trees. In temperate deciduous forests, there's usually a lot of rain and snowfall and high humidity. Um, They uh, the this biome is more open. Uh, the trees are not as tall as in tropical forests, so it's not as dense as a tropical forest. Um, temperate forests also have quite a few layers of producers, um, short herbs, intermediate shrubs, and tall trees. They are very di- have very diverse um, animal species that live um, here in these biomes as well. The taiga, or conifer forest, is um, very familiar to all of us because that's where we live. Um, This is characterized, this biome, by very harsh winters, short, cool summers. Snow is the major form of precipitation, which is not available to plants until the spring thaw. This biome is obviously dominated by coniferous trees, um, but there are a variety of deciduous trees as well, uh, you know that aspen, willow, alder sometimes. Um, the organisms in this biome are usually adapted well for the cold. Let's look at the tundra biome. Um, this occurs beyond the tree line or at very high altitudes. The plants in the tundra are very compact, shrubby, mat like, dwarf. Um, in the Arctic tundra, There's permafrost, um, so the ground is continually frozen and the plants cannot penetrate very far into the soil. Um, Additionally, um, the tundra can have extremely low uh, precipitation and uh, be very, very dry. However, because um, 
in situations where we have permafrost layer, it blocks the drainage, so it keeps the soil kind of soggy. Um, in the Arctic as well, um, the tundra there, the summer days are very short, so there are a lot of adaptations both for plants and animals um, that have been made in order to deal with all of these unique conditions in the tundra. Here's just a little uh, comparison um, diagram showing uh, the, some of the different biomes and how the temperature and the moisture uh, compare from one biome to another. We can see the hottest, wettest, um, or extremely wet rainforest would be um, in that category as opposed to the desert, which is very dry. Um, and those are the different tropical biomes. We have temperate biomes, um, the more moist uh, being the temperate forest and desert being the dry subarctic and arctic biomes as well. And it's just kind of a comparison of some of the different climatic factors in those biomes. Let's look now at aquatic systems. Aquatic systems, as I said before, are divided into two categories. We have freshwater ecosystems and we have marine ecosystems. Freshwater ecosystems are just what they uh, imply. Rivers and ponds are included there. Marine ecosystems, oceans, and estuaries. Just a side note, in case you don't know what an estuary is, it is a location where the freshwater stream meets the ocean. So in freshwater ecosystems, um, obviously there is a huge variety um, of ecosystems represented in freshwater. We have um, clearly in rivers, the, the motion of the water creates all kinds of um, different factors for those ecosystems than a pond or a marsh would. But let's look at um, some basic characteristics kind of similar to most of these. Um, phytoplankton is the uh, generally the primary producer. Phytoplankton are cyanobacteria and little protists that are photosynthetic and they provide um, and the nutrients for the rest of this ecosystem. Uh, they're usually, the limiting factors for phytoplankton are usually nitrogen and phosphorus um, in their growth. Zooplankton over here, those are very tiny protists and very, very small animals and that feed on the phytoplankton. Um, the, some of the um, consumers that would consume the zooplankton um, and higher levels of consumers would be fish, insects, mollusks, and um, higher consumers still would be larger fish, snakes, frogs, toads. And we, then we also have other predators um, included in this ecosystem, such as raccoons, otters, and birds. Um, this is extremely diverse, and uh, we're not going to go much more in depth than that right now. Let's look at marine ecosystems. Um, marine ecosystems are divided, uh, as I said, into zones. And those zones are based on depth of the water, penetration of light that gets to that um, portion of the water, and the distance of that water from the shoreline. So let's take a look at some of these uh, marine ecological zones. Uh, the first one we're going to look at is the photic zone. And when we talk about the photic zone, we're talking about how much light is penetrating the water. And you can see the photic zone is the shallow water on the very top, the surface of the water, and light easily penetrates. Therefore, uh, photosynthesis can occur here. It's really important to note that almost all of the energy that sustains marine communities comes from the photosynthesis of phytoplankton in this photic zone. Um, it's really important. And then when we start looking at the aphotic zone, it is this area down here where there is not sufficient light for photosynthesis to occur. So organisms in this zone uh, obtain energy by either consuming living or dead organic material that was produced in the photic zone. There are some organisms in the aphotic zone that depend on chemoautotrophic bacteria that are associated with hydrothermal vents as well. So while we have the photic zone and the aphotic zone as being characterized by the amount of light penetrating the water, um, we're going to look now at the next three zones here. 
that are characterized by the depth of the water itself. The intertidal zone, uh, that's just the shore area between high tide and low tide, right here, the intertidal zone. Uh, we have the neuritic zone, and on our graph it's right there. You can see that's the very shallow water that extends out over the continental shelf. And then we have the oceanic zone, and that is basically the open ocean water beyond that shelf. Now we have three more zones to look at, and uh, those are these three. You're going to see that some of these zones definitely overlap. We could have a photic oceanic uh, zone or a photic oceanic zone, um, and you'll see that with these as well. Um, the abyssal zone, let's look at that one right here. And it is what it kind of sounds like in the great abyss. <laughs> no light gets there whatsoever. Um, the area in the, the abyssal zone uh, contains organisms that are very adapted to continuous darkness, very cold temperatures, scarce food, and extreme pressure because uh, the abyssal zone is very deep. We also have the benthic zone, and that is right along here. The benthic zone... Um, is the seafloor, basically. Um, that seafloor um, consists of bacteria, sponges, worms, sea stars, crustaceans, um, many other organisms there. We have the pelagic zone. And in this zone, um, it is basically the open water that is not associated with the seafloor. So you can see that right here. Um, it's any of this open water that doesn't have anything to do with the seafloor. Very different kinds of uh, organisms live on that seafloor than they do in the open water. So main ideas. I just uh, wrote down a review of some of the things we've talked about, the different terrestrial biomes, different types of aquatic systems, freshwater versus marine, and then those different zones in the marine aquatic, um, the marine ecosystems. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in class and doing some projects related to these fun ideas.